Hello, and welcome to episode 5 of the Fiber Circus. It's Wednesday, September 26th of 2018, and I'm your host, Elizabeth. If you're a new viewer, thank you very much for tuning in, and if you're a returning viewer, thanks a lot for coming back. This is a podcast mainly about knitting, spitting, hand dyeing, um, machine knitting, and our farm, which has alpacas, llamas, pygora, and a teeswater sheep and my adventures in fiber travels. So, if you'd like to get a hold of me, you can contact me on Ravelry or Instagram as Spotted Circus, all one word. I also have a Facebook group called Spotted Circus Alpacas and Labas, or you can email me at spottedcircusalpacas at yahoo.com. In case you couldn't tell, I have a pretty nasty cold this week, and as a result, I am drinking a tea today in this very cute cat hipster mug, and it came as a pack of four with cats with different hats on um, that I got at TJ Maxx actually and my tea today is thank goodness for David's tea because they have cold 911 and cold 91 kind of reminds me of the smell of Vicks but in a tea so if you actually kind of like the smell of Vicks you'd like this tea it has organic peppermint apple juniper berries with eucalyptus and orange flavoring it says, bad colds require badass interventions. Take this tea, for example. It's a deliciously soothing mix of peppermint, juniper, and eucalyptus. Um, it's pretty good at, when you're feeling kind of sick. It does actually help to open up your sinuses quite a bit. So hopefully I won't have the sneezes and I won't get the coughs during the middle of the podcast today, but it's not a guarantee. So if so, I'll try to edit it out. So works in progress. Um, I've been traveling um, last week. I was in Colorado for, let me think, Monday, Tuesday, three or four days. I don't remember exactly how long, and it kind of runs together because the drive is like an 18-hour drive, and so I tend to do it overnight, so I'll leave at night on Sunday and get in like Monday afternoon, but then coming back, I lose a couple of hours, so it really kind of throws you off. Um, I think I tried to leave Colorado Thursday at... When did I leave? I left there by about 9 a.m. And I got back home physically about 5 a.m. on Friday. Um, it was a little bit longer drive because I had a couple alpacas with me. And one of them decided that she was not ashamed to go poop. And so we had to stop a little bit more often and actually let some extra out. So it was a bit of an adventure. But it's always kind of nice to have critters in the van with you because it's, you don't feel so alone when you're driving. Um... So I didn't do a ton of knitting, but what I have knit on has been pretty monogamous. So I've been knitting on my Portage sweater. Not a real big surprise there. Um, last time, um, I think I'd finished the ribbing for the bottom and actually bound off. And I had just started picking up the stitches for the edging. So this garter band right here is for the edging. I've got a total of six inches to do, and then I'm going to be working on pockets that are actually going to be coming down the sides here. So this is taking a ton of yarn. I've gone, I'm on my fourth ball right now, and all I have left is this out of the fourth ball, and each of those balls was a little over 250 yards. <coughs> so I'm about a thousand yards in. Um, I think I'm roughly at about four and a half inches. And I probably have another inch and a half or so to go, at least. My husband and I have been watching the, the TV show The Flash um, late at night right now. And so through an episode of The Flash, I can usually knit two to three rows, which that's a lot of stitches, in my opinion. <coughs> really have to excuse me. Talking has obviously caused my throat to decide to be nasty right now. So that, for the most part, is all that I've really been knitting on, and it's not like me to be this monogamous in knitting, but for some reason I feel the urge to actually get this done before SAF. So I've got mm, four weeks maybe till SAF, in which case I've got to get the arms done and finish this edging. Don't know that it's going to happen, but I'm going to try. Um, <coughs> it's still living in my bags, my awesome granny bag with the cute little kids catching fireflies on it. So that's really all that I've been working on this week. I haven't cast on anything new, although I've been really tempted to. I keep eyeballing these Colorwork sweaters, and I saw actually a really interesting Colorwork sweater 
a couple of episodes back, excuse me, on the Fruity Knitting Podcast, and the color work was all done via slip stitching, so that way you didn't have to know how to manage two colors at once. And so I'm kind of tempted to knit that for some reason, simply because I think it would be easier. But then when I'm looking at it going, if I'm going to knit a fingering weight color work sweater, I might as well just do full color work and make it custom. Because, you know, go big or go home. So we'll see. I may or may not start something, but I definitely want to try to get my portage done before I get into it. So since I haven't cast anything on, I actually have several finished objects. So the first finished object I was working on the last time during the podcast, and it's the beloved Aaron hat. And it's a free pattern on Ravelry. And it is by Solinqua something. I was knitting it out of my new Aran weight yarn that is a silk tube with alpaca and merino actually blown into it. And this colorway is called Frost. And so I finished the hat. I knit it to the pattern's instructions. It actually had a pretty good size ball of yarn left over. So I really could have made it a little bit slouchier. But I think it turned out pretty nice. It actually holds the stitch definition pretty well. Um, I'm considering putting a pom-pom on it. Like a big fake fur one. Because I think if I tried to make a pom-pom out of this yarn, because of the structure that it is with this silk tube, I don't think that a pom-pom would hold up quite right. So overall, I probably have a little over half the skein left. So this hat maybe weighs three or four ounces. It's extremely lightweight. But I really like the way that the stitch definition turned out. So it's definitely a yarn I'm going to start carrying. Um, once I do an event this next weekend, I'm going to order in some more and dye up some more of it. But the hat turned out really nice. And it's in a Halloween bag by um, the Fat Squirrel Speaks. Yeah, I think it's pretty cute. So I got a project done before Halloween in my Halloween bag, so that's kind of nice. Um, the other finished objects that I got done this week were all actually machine knitting related. I'm going to be vending at a winery here in the next few weeks, and I wanted to have some finished goods that I'd actually made done, but as you can see, I'm not the fastest knitter in the world. So I decided to make some really simple machine knit hats. So I took a bunch of one-off skeins where they're either one of a kind or had something a little bit off with them, and I decided to start making hats with them. So this is the first hat that I made. It's a really simple 2 by 2 ribbing that I do on my ribber, and then I transfer all the needles up and do a stock in it tube. So, I hope people like slouchy hats, because that's what they're going to get. It's pretty similar to a sock head hat. Um, the brim is doubled over. But I think it turned out pretty cute. This was a one-of-a-kind skein, so I can't repeat it. And I guess that's why it wasn't really selling in the shop. So I decided to make it into a hat. So I have that one. I have this hat. Which is kind of a neon pink with some oranges. And today's obviously hat try-on day. Once again, just a nice kind of fluffy hat. If you have a big ponytail, you can actually stick it all the way in. I had some people ask me about messy bun hats, and to me, why waste the heat that's going to go out of the top of the messy bun when you can just tuck it into a hat? I also used one of my skeins of self-striping sock yarn in the colorway Witchy, and I made this hat, which I didn't double the brim on this one, mainly because I kind of forgot, and I haven't done the ends in yet, but I kind of forgot to double it over, but if somebody really wanted to, they could still roll up the brim. But it's nice how the self-striping sock yarn makes such a self-stripe on it. Yeah, I still need to block it. It's still a little firm. And you can see that right there is what made this a seconds for me. Normally when I dye this up as a self-striping, there's not a black blotch in the middle of the green. So this is witchy, in case you decide you like that for a pair of socks or something for yourself. And then I did one other one, and this was actually the very first one that I did. And I'm starting to take it apart already because when I did it, I did the ribbing only for, I think, 10 rows, and I didn't double it over. And as a result, when you had it as a hat, it just rolled under and it didn't look quite right. And I also did a pattern on this hat, and it's a slip stitch pattern. The machine actually does all this patterning for me. Um, when I went to go seam it up, it just, the hat didn't look quite right, especially with this turned under edge. So... 
I decide I'm going to just rip it out because it's easier to just go ahead and rip it out and then make it into something that will work. So it'll probably become a slouchy hat. So this is three finished hats. Um, if I wasn't feeling sick and my brain wasn't caputing on me every now and then, each one of these hats would maybe take me 30 to 40 minutes to make it the most. Um, and it was under 400 yards of sock yarn for each of these. So it's a pretty quick and easy knit. Um, basically what I did was I cast on, first off I have a standard gauge Brother 970. It's the last model that Brother made that was an electronic, so it was kind of their top of the line with a computer built into it. And you can find them on eBay, but the full machine with the ribber, you're looking at $1,000 usually. I didn't pay anywhere near that for mine. I found an estate sale that had that machine two other machines, um, 90 cones of acrylic yarn and a stand and a lot of other stuff. And I paid less than $400 for all of that. So the key is you've got to know what you're looking for and you've got to keep your eye out for stuff. Uh, I tend to see a lot for sale on Facebook marketplace and on Craigslist. And I also follow estatesales.net, um, to keep an eye out for knitting machines. I am doing some custom buying for people if they give me a budget and they say hey here's what it is that I want I will go out and find machines for them so recently I purchased a standard gauge and a bulky gauge for a customer of mine and I'm gonna make sure that they're fully working completely test them out before I hand them over to her so that way she's ready to go with them so she should like them quite a bit the machine knitting is a lot of fun but to do these basically I cast on for two by two ribbing and this is done flat so this entire hat is seamed. You can see I've got a seam right there and the seam runs up the back. could knit the top of this hat in a circle because my machine will allow me to knit back and forth on two different beds, but it would require me taking these ribbing stitches and actually moving them off of one bed and onto another, and that's just too much work for me. So I just instead, I cast on approximately 184-ish stitches. And I cast off for 2x2 two two ribbing on a tension number 3 for a fingering weight. I did between 40 and 44 rows. And then I transfer the ribbing stitches, which would be the knit stitches in this case, onto the main bed. And then I just work flat at a tension 5, maybe 6, depending on how I feel the fabric's going. And I do right about 100 to 140 rows. I kind of take a tape measure and see about how long it is when I'm working on it. And then when I get up to the top, the decreases are very simple because I haven't figured out how to do more complicated ones in a quick manner yet. And I basically transfer every other stitch to its friend next door so that way I decrease by half, knit two rows, and then knit a third row at a higher tension. And then I just drawstring it and run a needle through it with thread, pull it all up tight, and then sew all the way down the back. And so I think the hats are pretty cute. I like this one. I think it's young and hip. You know, the pink and the purple will actually glow under black lights with this yarn, which is kind of cool. Um, price wise, so this skein of yarn right here, because it's self strife, being retails for about $30. Most likely, I'm probably going to be asking around $45 for this hat. I'm hoping I get that. We'll see. Um, the other hats that aren't self striping, maybe around $40 for those. So, we'll see how they sell. Uh, I needed to have some kind of finished goods in order to be able to sell there. And this was the quickest way for me to be able to actually churn out some stuff on my own. And it's also a really good use for those single skeins that are kind of one-offs. So, spinning. I haven't spun anything. I keep meaning to start. Um, I'm going to be starting the bats that I showed on the last podcast from Frost Yarn. And I'm going to spin them all sequentially and then either chain ply them or ply them with a thread in order to maintain the long, long color um, long color repeats. And I'll probably get started on that this weekend when I'm sitting out at the winery vending because spinning tends to draw people in. So I'll probably get going on that this weekend. Acquisitions. I haven't bought anything. Good job, me. Um, travels. So last week I did travel out to Colorado to do a large commercial fleece sort. I'm going to be doing a video next week. I was going to do it this week, but because of my cold, it's just not going to work well with it. But next week I'm going to go through and show you the actual sorting of a fleece and what you want to look for in purchasing a fleece as far as good traits, bad traits, you know, what will affect your yarn and what won't. Um, 
while we were there, we saw some very interesting things. Uh, there was another sorter, and I, um, the other sorter is Winnie Labreck, and she's kind of been the fiber guru for all things alpaca fiber, and she also created the standard for yak fiber judging, which is pretty cool. So her and I were both sorting, and we sorted approximately 1,400 pounds of alpaca in a day and a half. Um, I would also guess that waste-wise, there was at least 200 if not more pounds that we had to throw out due to heavy debris a ton of guard hair which would have basically made the yarn extremely prickly or you'd lose over half the weight in it and then there was a lot of dirt and just filth in some of these fleeces unfortunately um, when we shear our alpacas i personally vacuum all of our animals prior to shearing as they're down on the mat and it does make a really large difference in their fiber at the end point of it and it's quite possible that because of all the fiber that I was into, that that's also possibly why I got some of this cold as well. Uh, I was exposed to fleeces from Texas, Colorado, Wisconsin, multiple areas of the U.S. And with that comes lots of different pollens, unfortunately. And normally I carry an N99 mask with me, but I didn't have my filters with me for some reason, so I couldn't really use it. And these fleeces were just in particularly really, really dirty. And in fact, as I was sorting one of the fleeces, I stuck my hand in and I was feeling around and I could feel this lump. And I, I was used to finding dirt, you know, poop, cockle burrs, other strange things. And when I pulled out this lump, it wasn't anything that I'd found before. And it was a dead lizard. Um, while well, it was a nice idea to add the dead lizard to this person's fleece to add some extra weight to get more money, we, we don't accept dead lizards as part of a yarn, unfortunately. I mean, I know they call stuff frog hair sometimes, but they don't really use frogs or lizards in the making of that. Um, that's the first lizard that I've found. Previously, I have found two dried up dead frogs in fleeces. I'm, this was really buried inside the fleece well, so I don't know if after shearing the animal crawled into the bag and then died in there or what uh the frogs i had talked to the owner about those previously and i said well are you guys shearing at night well no and it the bag got sealed up immediately afterwards and put up in their barn and so the only thing i could figure out is that somehow the frogs were in the fleece and got shorn off and then went in the bag and died it's a little bit strange i think but i mean i've seen Actually, I take that back. I've seen a dead baby snake before in a fleece, too. And that was pretty gross. I don't do snakes. They're just not not, not, not nice animals. Um, and so, you know, it's amazing what you will find in fleeces sometimes. You know, and when you're an alpaca farmer, this is your harvest. And this should be how you're making back some of your money for the year. And if you don't care enough to remove dead creatures from your fleece, then I think you don't have the right idea going on. So next week I'm going to be showing off some fleeces. Um, while we were out there, we found probably one of the brightest and shiniest fleeces I've ever seen. Um, the judging scale goes from a 1 to 10 on brightness, and this was definitely at a 9, which is really actually very hard to achieve. Um, it's a white fleece that when you look at it, it literally glows and reflects back like a mirror on you. So I'll have all the information on that fleece. Um, you know, it's a really interesting fleece. And just some other interesting fleece tips next week when I have a little less of a cold and I can actually talk for longer periods of time. So that was all my travel this past week. Upcoming events next Saturday. So not this upcoming one, but the Saturday after on October the 6th. I'm going to be at the Owen Valley Winery in Spencer, Indiana here. It's like 20 minutes from my house. Um, for their Harvest Moon Festival. And it's a one-day event on Saturday. It starts at either 10 or 12. I don't honestly remember which. And I think it runs till 5. But there's going to be bands and all sorts of artisans. Um, I've seen where they've advertised already that there's a guy where you can get this like mold made out of sand and you can etch things into it. And they'll actually cast molten aluminum into it, which seems kind of cool to me. Um, bands, obviously wine, um... I think there's a tamale lady that's pretty well known in the area that's going to be there also. So, you know, come out, stop by, say hi. I'm going to have dryer balls, socks, machine knit hats. Um, I'll have some yarn. What else do I have? 
I have some gloves. I may take a bit of fleece. Um, I'll have some felted soaps too. Not real sure what all the people will be into out at the winery, but maybe the later that they drink, maybe the more they'll want to buy. So I will have some interesting things there available for sale. And then after that, the 26th and 28th of October is the Southeastern Animal Fiber Fair, also known as SAF, which is in Asheville, North Carolina. It's a three-day fiber festival. There's also fleece shows and animal shows attached to it. So I highly recommend coming out. Um, there's a lot of really good classes that you can take there also. I'm vending almost directly in the center of the main building. Uh, I think it's the third or fourth row down from what I remember. I'll have a big double booth and I'll have everything that you could ever want there, including stuff you may not know that you needed, but I'll have it. Um, I'll definitely have pineapple fiber there which is one of the new fibers, and I'll have that in little one-ounce samplers that you can try. Uh, probably 40 to 50 colors of Angelina. There will be a couple new yarns there, and I definitely want people to stop by because I don't just have alpaca. I also carry a lot of wools and synthetic materials for people that are allergic to alpaca or allergic to wool. So stop by, say hi. Uh, we had a contest last weekend, or last weekend, last episode. We ran a contest, you know, of like the podcast, uh, f subscribe to the podcast, and then share it with a friend who you thought might enjoy the podcast. Some of you were very inventive and shared the podcast with each other, which I find very entertaining, Marjorie and Isla. I know that you both tagged each other as people who might like the podcast, which I find entertaining. Um, so there was 22 entries, and I chose with random number generator, and the random number was number six, and the winner is Cassandra W. So Cassie, you know who you are. Send me a message, Facebook, Instagram, whichever it is, and you can pick any type of yarn or fiber out of the shop that you would like. Uh, from what I understand, I think that you're a crocheter at times. And if not, I know that you have some knitting friends who could maybe knit for you. So send me your address and send me a link or a name of the yarn that you would like, and I will send it your way. So thanks a lot for participating. Uh, brush shop, up, bleh, shop update. So I haven't done much dyeing simply because I haven't been home. Um, but I did get in a new yarn base that I'm getting ready to try. And it's a brushed alpaca yarn. And it's an alpaca with nylon and merino. And it's a lace weight that's designed to be very similar to, like, the mohair yarns that people are using so much in patterns these days. I haven't dyed it yet, so I want to see how it reacts to being dyed. Uh, a couple of people that I've talked to have said that when they dyed it, all the brushed section came out and they were left with a strange textured yarn. So we'll see what happens there. It's not superbly soft, in my opinion. And it's mainly because they're using a higher micron fiber for the brushed alpaca part of it. So we'll see how it takes to the dye. I may try to carry some of it. I may not. And the main reason for me wanting to carry it is because I am slightly allergic to mohair. Whereas this is an alpaca alternative to it. So we'll see. Um, it's a 50 gram skein and I think it's 199 meters. So that's like... 200 and some odd yards if I remember right so we'll try it I'm gonna die up five or six of them this week and see what happens it may be a reoccurring special yarn it may go by the wayside on the clearance bin pretty quick we'll see so I think that's the majority of the updates that I can think of for this week um, it's kind of a shorter podcast, mainly because I don't feel awesome at all. And as it is right now, sitting underneath the lights, I feel really sweaty, which is kind of gross. Um, so we're going to take you out to the sideshow. And this week's sideshow performer will be Bruce, who's a Pygore goat. I may throw a little bit of video of the Kriya running around because she's really cute right now. And she's in a phase where when you talk to her, she actually comes running up to you with her tail up in the air. And then she looks at you for a little bit, and she's starting to spit at you. So she's getting a little bit of attitude in her. Um, if you don't want to see her eyeball, which is still healing, and it's actually doing a really good job at healing, but it is kind of white and red right now. So it's kind of, it could look like a zombie, technically. Um, we're hoping it continues to heal the rest of the way over, but it's just going to take time. It's a long-term management for the injury. So we may put in a little bit video there, and you may catch a slight glimpse of her eye, so don't be alarmed if you see it. Um, eventually, I'm going to be doing a full post on Facebook showing the progression of the injury. 
because it's actually very interesting to see what it started out as and what it's gone to because I've taken weekly photos of it to see the progression and so it'll be something interesting you know if you want to actually see it later on and you don't mind seeing icky stuff um, you know she's not in any kind of pain she's running around just fine she jumps up in the air like a goofball she every now and then will run into an alpaca on that side but it's mainly because she's not paying attention I think and the adult decides to go right in front of her so she's still kind of cute so Otherwise, I will plan on seeing you guys in two weeks, and hopefully you come out to the winery if you're local at all, and I will see you then. Bye. Hi, baby. Hi. 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 Where are you going? Where are you going? Hmm? Where are you going? Baby. So this is Bruce, and Bruce is a Pygora goat. Pygoras were developed in the late 80s, and it came from a cross of pygmy goats, which are normally the little fat ones you see at the zoo that are always trying to eat your clothes, and Angora goats, which usually have the long silky fiber that you know about. Pygoras were mainly developed because they needed, they wanted to be able to get softer fiber that lasted for a longer time. And as you can see, he's decided to run away. And he plays with the dog. Come here, Bruce. Bruce. So Bruce is a type B. There's three types of uh, pygora goats. There's the class C, which are cashmere types. And they produce a soft, downy undercoat. There's a type A, which is more of an angora. And then there's Bruce, which is a type B. So you can kind of see the gray fiber there. Thank you, Ted. It's his long, silky fiber that he produces. You can see he's also very fat like a pygmy goat. Um, his micron stays under 24, and it's long and silky. Um, he does have an undercoat with guard hair. You can see these prickly black hairs up on his top. And his prickly hairs, he actually has to be dehaired as a result. Um, but Bruce's personality, as you can tell, he likes to play with the dog on a regular basis, kind of hang out. Um, I think he's going on four, if I remember right. But he's a pretty nice little goat. He's friendly. He likes to get into trouble and eat things. Um, but his fiber is pretty nice. It's long, silky, super shiny, and gray, which is what we like here.